everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about introduction to gRPC. Uh, I know that the title was mainly about what's gRPC and how it's being related to REST API and even uh, driven uh, architecture and so on. But I, I decided that during pre preparing for the presentation that I'll mainly talk about gRPC because uh, having that compared to other solutions is um, is a topic for a different presentation. I just wanted to give you a short glance on what gRPC is and how you can use it and so on. Internally, we're using that for one of our projects. Uh, it's mainly not the best uh, uh, suited, to, like gRPC is not the best thing that we could use here, but it's a starting point for us to, to build better um, communication between services internally on, on our servers. So, okay, let me get started. Uh, shortly about myself, uh, I'm Alan Parshevsky. Um, I'm related to Ruby, I'm related to Google, I'm application architect based in Wrocław office in Poland um, and interested mainly in all those technologies that are related to the web or to the Google Cloud. Um, but yeah, I was talking about myself, I was talking about uh, solutions with gRPC, but first let me uh, give you some information about what is RPC. I know that we already have something in our mind, like during our work, we've seen XML RPCs, uh, we've seen SOAP, we've seen other solutions. And uh, I don't know how about you, but for me, those experiences with all those technologies that has RPC in it, I felt like I'm working on Windows 95 and doing really bad things and I didn't like it. Like, and, and that was really bad. So when I heard about gRPC, I was very skeptical because um, I, I, you know, RPC is already, in my opinion, a little bit negative word in IT world because, because of those large technologies that were used and that were great, but they were, they, they fit only some part of the world. Like, but for some, if you wanted to customize many things, it was not the best solution. Um, but yeah, what is RPC? RPC is remote procedure call. So mainly what we know is that we have a computer program that calls a procedure in a remote address space. That, that's what it is. You have a client that's either uh, like some IoT device or mobile phone, tablet, browser. Uh, it goes with some procedure and it, it calls it uh, in, on server. So it's very simple, straightforward. Uh, you could built uh, the whole thing. I mean, RPC systems, uh, it's not hard to build it. Uh, it's, it's just a matter of, of knowing how to build the protocol and so on, but, but it's not the, the fun part, I believe. Um, so when RPCs were usually used, um, if you were working in C Sharp, Java, you so many uh, services. It, before REST API was famous and popular, that was the, the way to go. And when, if, when any, many legacy systems uh, or enterprises, you still see it because it was a great tool. You provided a contract and so on, but at the same time, um, People were using it not in the way they should, and you saw a blob, great, great big blob of XML files, um, and you just had to build it and send it to the server, and it responded with some weird error messages that you know, or 500 error. I've seen many of those. I integrated with many travel providers. Um, so if you wanted to book a hotel in some offer on some provider you had to use these and it was really a pain um, so mainly in large distributed systems uh, that are created with multiple microsystems like before microsystems were even popular rpcs were great for that um, we in one of our projects we're using rpcs to communicate uh, with uh, Java library. So we just call it from some Node.js code and we're just using um, RPC to, to call Java and get some information from that. So that, that also works for us. So, uh, but when you need reliable communication, that is really critical that you want to make sure that two points are connected to each other, uh, that's where you only want to use RPC systems. Uh, if you want to build systems that are tightly coupled, you'll not change many things. Uh, you just want to make sure that data are flowing from one part to another. That's also a great thing, especially if you're using the same language because you can have a Java code somewhere and on other place they can communicate with each other by using some RPCs protocols. Uh, but if you want to build one, um, what what you need to do? Like there are a few questions that you need to ask yourself, like, like what about authentication? How are you going to support that? Are you going to do request reply standard thing or you'll start with streaming? Uh, 
uh, have built data serialization. Um, so we've seen examples like XML RPC, JSON RPC, or SOAP. They were using those specific languages uh, that were great for, for them, but that was really huge. Um, so, so that's that's the question you need to ask if you want to do binary serialization or or anything else. How server will expose it? So, how are you going to build the server? How it's going to build every like, how how the service will be available for your users, and how a client will consume it? Will there be some tool that will uh, simply will provide uh, WSDL or SOAP URL, and it will get all services that you want to do, or there will be some other things. So there are a few uh, questions that you need to ask yourself uh, when you when you want to build RPC. Uh, and those questions were asked uh, by by Google. So they they were asking themselves how they can build RPCs. They have large system. They have lots of connection points. They needed to build something that will be reliable for them and that will work great. Uh, so that's that's why they started working on gRPC. But before gRPC was famous and it was open source, uh, it was called Stubby. Uh, there were four generations of that uh, uh, internally in, in Google. And they started to building things with that and then that started to, to work well for them. And after that, they, they decided, oh, it's now time to release it as open source tool. Um, but yeah, I was talking about RPCs. I was talking about some history about uh, how gRPC was created, but what is gRPC? Uh, like previously, I, I remember that at the beginning, gRPC was uh, translated to Google remote procedure calls. Uh, now they are using funny re recursion here. So it's gRPC is just gRPC remote procedure calls. Um, and it's a great high-performance RPC framework that can work in every any environment. Uh, I'll in, in, in after a few slides, I'll show you what were the main principles that Google wrote down and that they decided that this is the principles that gRPC has to have. Um, so that that's how they ended up with building this high-performance RPC framework. And as I said, it, it was built by Google initially. They're using it internally in all production apps. So if you're using Gmail, uh, some GCP uh, so services or anything like it, internally it will communicate by using this uh, either Stabi or for newer services it will be gRPC. Uh, they have right now lots of RPCs per second. I cannot tell you how many. Uh, there's 10 zeros in, in that number. So, uh, so there's lots of calls that are coming back and forth uh, internally and it's working great for them. Uh, so we should, I believe we should trust them. Like well, that's one of the greatest provider of services and the biggest one. So, so we could trust in, in their expertise. Uh, so what it allows you, it allows you to connect uh, services uh, along many data centers. Uh, and what's also great that you can extend it. Like if you want, you can add load balancing, tracing, you can add some health checks, logging, authentication, and so on. There's lots of things that you can add, and it's it's based in in the protocol itself. You can you can extend it, so there's uh, there's no need to do some hacking if you if you want to do simple stuff like monitoring. Uh, it's it could be great thing if you have lots of IoT devices and you just want to send some short information about, uh, let's say you have temperature sensors and you want to just send uh, lots of things, uh, lots of data every single second from thousands of uh, devices to, to your backend service. And that, that's a great thing where you could use gRPC. Uh, that would be a last mile of, of this distributed computing. And then in the cloud, you can, you can just uh, do with the data whatever you want. Um, so this is just a huge tool, a uh, huge framework that is allowing you to to build services with that. So, you know, the description is quite simple, um, but what great about it is that Google is pushing hard to uh, not, not not only Google, like every like open source community is pushing hard to have libraries for client or generators for server stuff. Uh, in many languages. I believe officially there are 10, but there are many more. Like this, this is just a part of the gRPC tool itself, but you can have your client libraries in many languages. And this is great because gRPC is using uh, protobufs that I will be discussing in a moment. Um, this is just great if you want to quickly generate client for your, for your clients. So you have a like server client for your service, 
and you provide uh, the package for your customers and they can simply use it uh, without writing lots of code. Um, it's very efficient uh, and very simple service definition. Again, if you remember uh, SOAP, uh, if you remember VSDL, you remember that writing the definition and itself the document was huge. Here, you'll by firstly looking at it, you'll understand what's going on. Uh, it supports bidirectional streaming, so that's something that you will not get in REST APIs. Uh, so HTTP JSON, uh, so we, and it's using HTTP2 transport layer. Um, as I said, it's already have pluggable auth tracing, load balancing, health checking, everything. It's built in the in the framework, and it's high throughput, high scalability, and low latency. That was the the goals that they they decided that they will do. Main user scenarios. Uh, I already told you about. Uh, generating client libraries, uh, this is uh, great, uh, but efficiently connecting many things in, in your environment, uh, like you have multiple services that need to communicate with each other, that's great. If you want to connect mobile devices, browser clients, to backend services, that, that could also work, um, but mainly it's all about sending lots of data or many data with high throughput uh, and scale it easy and with low latency. That's that's the main goal. And you will not use it for your client-facing APIs where you just want to make sure that it's easy to understand and so on. Um, if you want to compare it, there is a nice article about a gRPC for Google Cloud PubSub. So they compared how, how much throughput they can get by comparing a gRPC and their old, old API that were using HTTP 1.1 and JSON. Uh, and you can see uh, the throughput is is great, uh, so it's I believe almost three times better. Uh, if you're talking about overall throughput, the throughput per CPU it's even better. So you see that scalability uh, allows you uh, to to just do it better, better efficiently manage your uh, CPU resources. So these are the principles that Google said that it has to be so uh, that they will work on services, not objects. So they'll build uh, service uh, using uh, interface definition languages. Uh, they said that they want to have coverage and simplicity so that everything should be available for every single language. So if, either, if you're using Java, Scala, or Dart, or, uh, or you simply want to build small services in Go, or anything like it, that it should be possible for, for that. Uh, it supports uh, uh, metadata exchange. So in HTTP 1.1, you can send uh, headers. Um, here, you can send metadata between um, server and client back and forth. So there's like you can you can do it, and it's it's worked very well. It supports cancellation and timeout. So if you want to cancel your request, the request will be canceled, uh, as well as uh, supporting timeout. If you'll say, oh, I don't want to get wait for longer time than 200 milliseconds it will stop the request and the server will stop also uh, working on that um, so there are lots of more i will not go through one by one uh, for me the biggest uh, thing is, is is streaming so that you can build just uh, streaming apis with that and that it's free and open and you can use it with multiple languages uh, even if you are not developer in that language it's very easy to, to just consume it um, that's the official list of languages that are supported. So C++, C Sharp, Ruby, uh, Dart, Python, Go, Java, Node.js. There are more available in open source. Uh, I believe Google will do one by one, add them to, uh, to, to the catalog of available technologies. Um, that, okay, I, I just want, that was a slide that uh, I will just tell one by one uh, where, uh, how Google implemented those things. Uh, so we have authentication, streaming, data serialization, and so on. So let's see how it worked for gRPC. So for gRPC, we're using, if you're talking about authentication, we're using SSL, TLS, and OAuth. There's also other options like some token-based authentication and so on. Uh, Streaming is supported. Uh, it also can control the, the flow. So even if you're streaming, you can say, "Oh, I I want uh, I have very slow clients, so I'll I'll just receive streams one like one by one." Or I have very fast server, and I will do something else. Like you can control the flow of of the communication. Uh, it's payload agnostic. Like proto buffers uh, are recommended. Proto buffers are uh, language that Google built to. Uh, to simply work with services, so build service definition. I'll show you the example in a minute. Uh, it's layered and pluggable, so you can 
do many things with that, like, uh, as I said, logging, monitoring, and so on. Uh, and IDL, so here in uh, written protobufs to describe service APIs. So that's, uh, that's how gRPC handled, like how to build server, how to build clients, and how to build service definition uh, at all. So if you're talking about transporting uh, over HTTP2, in normal world, if you're opening the website, uh, you probably will see that uh, if you go to the Google um, Dev Console, you'll see that the, you're making many calls just to fetch some information. Uh, even if you're using single API, you'll open multiple TCP connections just to get that information. Here in HTTP, uh, like thanks to HTTP2, that JRPC is built up on that, uh, there's one TCP connection for each client server pair. So uh, that's why in the example here, you can see that uh, requests, uh, like getting the response is very fast because you do not use that many I.O. Uh, for, for getting the information. So the stream is open and you can send data back and forth. Um, so, so as I said, stream is multiplexed. So I'll sh show you in a minute uh, maybe uh, some uh, picture how it looks like, uh, which ends up with reduced latency. And yeah, bidirectional streaming or server push. This is this is great if you want to build applications that simply is waiting for some information to happen. Like uh, let's say you usually we used WebSockets to get information. Now you can use gRPC as well. Uh, so there will be open connection, and you can send uh, data from the server to the client. Uh, so as I said, in HTTP one, if you want to fetch uh, like information. Uh, from the server, each resource has to be downloaded by fetch, like using sing, uh, separate TCP connections. In HTTP2, you're not doing that. That's that's how it's really good, and that's the future of the web uh, because we'll use less connections to to get stuff. And here, in the example, you see that there's the JavaScript, CSS, and so on. But if you're talking about APIs, it'll be just information from like the proto uh, responses that you'll get. Okay, um, uh, let's let's talk shortly about protobufs. Uh, that's the automated, like the language that allows you to build this uh, structured service and data. So it's like XML, um, but smaller, faster, simpler. So, so here you can see that there is a service that is defined and that service, uh, is a part of the package. So there are packages, like if you're working with Java, you already know what's going on. Like you have packages and you can build lots of services, uh, include them and so on. So here I built a package that will be uh, ice cream truck. So ice cream truck will, uh, you, you can get ice cream, you can get ice creams by name, you can get best ice creams and get ice creams, all ice cream. So here you can see that sometimes stream is here, sometimes stream is here. So here, this call is made if you if you like in traditional HTTP uh, API. So you just want to get one ice cream, uh, and to to get it, you, it will use Ivan code. So I'm saying, oh, I just want to get one ice cream. Give me that, and after you get Ivan code, it will return you uh, the information about the ice cream itself. We can also get ice creams by name. You can think about it like searching. So you just want to, uh, sorry, that was uh, by flavor. I want to get ice creams by flavor. I want to get all ice creams that are matching some base flavors. I have flavors defined here. I have get ice cream by flavor and it will give me the stream. As soon as server will find something, it will return the, inf the, uh, the information about ice cream. So you can wait like uh, two milliseconds, you'll get one. Then it tries to find harder. Uh, after 10 milliseconds, you'll get another one. And that's uh, server side uh, streaming. We can also get get best ice cream. So let's say you're providing the list of ice creams that you want to choose one of the best of them. So you're doing client server, uh, client uh, side streaming. So you stream the uh, list of ice creams and in the response, you'll get only one ice cream that is the best. Um, and also get ice creams uh, if you want to get multiple ice creams and you just want to get them uh, as a stream. It's a bi-directional stream. And that's the simplest example I could think of how how you can uh, show what you can do with, uh, with gRPC and how you can configure it using protobufs. So here it's pretty straightforward. There is a nice uh, guide that uh, tells you what to do. It's even, there is even mapping from JSON to, 
to GR, to protobufs. So you can see it's it's straightforward. You have int string flavor, which is anum and float. Those numbers here are important because in future, if you want to extend it, um, all services that are using old proto uh, proto files they can still communicate with this API. It will simply not get anything that was added. So I can add here a float price. Let's say I'll uh, add color. So I'll just have string color equals five. And all services that are using old proto definitions, they will not see that color in the response, but everything that will be new, you can see it. So you can see that you can build also backward compatible uh, things with, with proto buffs. And, and so on and so on. So those numbers are saying at which position in the response it's all saved. Uh, after all, everything that you serialize using protobufs is a binary data. So it's, it's not storing, like JSON is storing, for example, field names. It's not storing that. It's just storing, uh, like, what if I will be deserializing the whole stream that I get from protobufs, you'll see that at the beginning there is a type there's a code for the type of the uh, of the field. Then there is a length of that field, and then you, you have the binary uh, value of, of that field, and that's it. So that's why it's very efficient because with JSON you you have to duplicate many things. If you're fetching arrays, you have to duplicate every single uh, field name. Here it's it's all in definition, and all you need to do is just to serialize it and, and use it. That's why it's it's very efficient. So again, Google built that and build that as an IDL. So that's an interface description language to describe the service API. It has to be straightforward. Uh, that was the goal. Uh, it has code generators for many languages. So if you remember Swagger and writing in Swagger, for example, for JSON APIs, that's something similar, like you, you're providing this and you're converting that to, uh, to the client library that you could simply use. Uh, data is uh, represented by binary. It's strongly typed. You cannot provide different value than the one that you provided in uh, in protobuf. So either client and also server will validate that, which is great because you cannot send wrong requests to the to the API. So you're securing yourself, uh, like with JSON schemas, for example. You're securing that that you will not send something that that server will not uh, be able to uh, serve. Uh, and as I said, it's extendable structure with backwards compatibility, and this is this is just great. Um, if I'll go here to my iterm, I'll just try to do a little bit bigger. And okay, here I I have one Node creature client and Ruby creature server. If I'll open it, I'll just show you in a second how this is a simple demo. Like the server will, what it will do, it will simply respond with that information. So it's very simple. Uh, here in Visual Studio Code. Uh, okay. Here in Visual Studio Code, if I'll go to Hello World, you'll see that the code is very simple. There's a service greeter that is doing say hello. There's a hello request with the name and hello reply. And what it does, it simply do string like sending a name and returning hello world. Like it's really hard to explain how hello world works. <laughs> um, okay, so and then we have uh, generated code. So if I'll if I'll go here. Uh, and this, uh, this is one of the tools that I've installed. It's a part of gRPC tools. Uh, the gRPC tool Ruby Protoc. Um, and okay, that that will simply convert from the hello world. Okay, I'll, I'll just change that from hello world. And it will generate the Ruby files. Okay, so let's go to this hello world. Uh, here and uh, let's say I want to add string name, uh, let's say string h2, for example. Uh, and if I will generate it, what it'll do, okay, simply here, what it'll do, it will take protos, this proto, hello world protos, and it will generate in leap uh, 
a leap Ruby version of of that uh, of that proto file. So it simply does it it converts the proto file to some format that will be understandable by the language. So here I will go to here and in the note, and I want to go to lib. Uh, here I have hello world pb and pb services. So you can see that. Internally, it will just convert it to some objects in Ruby, and you have add message, and you have optional things and everything else, and it, it's all used by description pool. And you have module, and this module is saying, oh, in the hello world, there are two types of objects that you can get or send. It's either hello reply or hello request, and if you want to find it, just look up for hello request here or hello reply here. It's really straightforward. I'll go and do the same for uh, for Node.js, it will do the same. Like, uh, of course, using different idiomatic things because that's different language, but still, you have two symbols that are exported as a global, and you have hello request and uh, uh, hello requests. And you have also, it's all prototypes, so you, everything is there actually. Well, for Ruby, you have to use also some. Uh, some additional tools to to parse it. So like, not parse it, but to to use it. So here, like Google Protobuf here, you probably could use everything like that without using external uh, libraries. I'm not a JavaScript developer. I'm just I'm just showing you how uh, how things are working here. If you're taking proto file and convert it to something else and in your language of choice. So here we have uh, the definition in Ruby for the types of messages that you can get to the receive. And here is the definition of the service. So you have Hello World Greeter Service. It's a generic service. Uh, here you can specify some configuration options. Service name is the Hello World Greeter. And the only RPC that we have is Say Hello. That is using Hello Request and Hello Reply. And here I, I have already greeter client or greeter server. So here we have a static greeter. So you see there is a stop that it's used. Um, and it's like on this uh, local host with the given port, it will, it will use the server. If user is provided, then it will use. If not, we're gonna just return hello world. And the message, sending the message to the server is very simple. You have a stop, you're saying say hello, because that, that's the method that we defined, if you remember here, uh, ha say hello. So we have say hello, and we are sending, again, some envelope with, uh, with your request. So you're sending hello world, hello request, name, and the user. Um, so that's a static streaming. It's it's actually the same. So I did here some oh, some change for streaming. So for streaming, it will return you an enumerator. So you'll say stop, say hello. You're sending the same request, and you'll get in each a greeting for for streaming. Uh, if I'll go to the server, it's also quite straightforward. So you have a greeter server that inherits from the hello world greeter service. All you need to do is uh, implement say hello method and, and that's it. And you, you can do whatever you want, but at the end it has to reply with the hello reply uh, message. So the, this one. So you have it, hello reply with message, hello, and it, and it's great straightforward. I hope Ruby, it's, it's uh, not a rocket science for anyone. Uh, I just wanted to, to show you the very simple idea how it works in, in, in languages. If I'll again go to uh, greeter server in JavaScript, it, it's the same. So you have to implement say hello function um, and set message and call back with that message. So that, that's the only difference. And then of course, there is a main function that will simply start their PC server uh, at listening on, on HTTP2 port, handle greeter servers, so handle that service. You can uh, handle multiple servers, so you can, with one server, you can configure multiple services, and then you can, uh, you can say, okay, you run it till it's terminated and interrupted, and that's it. Um, so yeah, that, that's very short demo how it, how it works. So getting back here, um, how to start, basically. You have to prepare proto file with service definition. Uh, if you go to this language guide on uh, on developers Google com proto buffer site, you will see how to build your service API. Uh, then you have to generate client code and stop using CLI. So I, I just showed you how to do that. It's in Ruby, it's it's very simple. Uh, in any other languages, it's the same. You just have to change from Ruby, for example, to Go. Uh, I don't have uh, Go tools installed here, 
but but you just change then change the comment and you, everything will be all be done by uh, by it. Uh, once you generate it, you have to extend the generated code with your logic for the server. So that's what what we did uh, here. Uh, that I can change, for example, from hello world, I can change that hello soft serve, and I'll, I can save it, and I can start the service. Um, so I'll start the service, and here note uh, will get that information. So it's it's very simple to to extend it. You just need to remember what has to be returned. Um, and invoke service using client stops. So that's also something that that you've seen uh, here. Uh, that you're using stop, uh, and you're just saying say hello, and it gives you the the message in the response. And then you, all you need to do is extend your service with additional things so like SSL TLS or token based authentication or logging. Uh, you can use there are many things I will show you in a second about some additional tools that you could use, but it's it's really great that you can extend it and it's straightforward. So those additional features I was referring to, uh, the first one is interceptors. So it allows you to, uh, if you're working with Ruby, especially there is a, a main uh, library that's used to build all H like HTTP servers. It's called Rack. And the rack is using middlewares. So simply middleware, it's just a part of the system that it gives you the request and it transforms the request. So here you can do the same. So interceptors, you can do logging, for example. I, I'm saying oh, before returning that information to the client, I just want to measure how fast it was. So I can do create interceptors and it will it will wrap the whole Thing and I can uh, log somewhere information about that. It's very simple. You can have timeouts, which is actually in JRPC world, it's called deadlines. So you're saying, I want to receive information, but I will not wait longer than 200 milliseconds. And what's great, servers knows about your timeout. So you'll say to the server, hey, I, I will not wait longer than 200 milliseconds. If you'll uh, insist to return the information um, after that 200 milliseconds, uh, your this request will be cancelled, so don't bother. So this is great because uh, in HTTP uh, like APIs, you probably saw things like you send the request, server is trying to return you with some response, and after a few seconds, you're saying I will not wait any longer, but server is still processing that because the timeout on the server is different than on the client. You can cancel the request, and also server will know about that. So you'll say, oh, I want to get that information. Oh, I'm waiting for too long. I will just cancel it. And server also will stop doing anything with, uh, with that request. If, you, if no one wants to have it, why, why should do it? There is a flow control that can steer. So as I said, you can uh, balance computing power, network capacity between client and server. Uh, this is great. And metadata exchange. So if you want to provide additional keys, uh, send them between client and server, you can also do that with gRPC. Um, how about people that are using gRPCs? Of course, Google is using it, uh, as I said, but also CoreOS, if, if you're using uh, CoreOS at CD, uh, version three is using gRPC only to communication. Uh, if Netflix is also using gRPC internally, Cockroach was using their own uh, RPC framework, but they migrated to gRPC without bigger issues. Um, so they are able to uh, to build database uh, that is really a low latency and high throughput. And Square uh, is also using gRPC. I believe all internal APIs uh, are currently, uh, RPCs are, are using gRPC for communication. So if you ever paid with Square, that's probably your request were sent through gRPC. Um, Okay, uh, what about the users and future gRPC? gRPC is not that young. It, I believe it's uh, three or four years old. Um, but in my opinion, it's in the future, it will be a first choice for internal RPCs. So if you're building service uh, IoT, uh, that you want to connect IoT devices with some uh, server, uh, that's a great thing. If you want to build communication within your cloud or w w internally, that's also a great thing if, to, to use gRPCs. New languages will be supported. Like every, like the new languages are created every few uh, three months. So you probably will see more and more languages supported by gRPCs. Uh, gRPCs will be supported in browsers. Well, it's it's already supported in browser. I will not. I was not able to perform a demo, but we have HTTP2 in Google Chrome, for example. So uh, it is supported in browser and either on the website for gRPC. 
you can use it. So probably for some services, we'll see a growth of usage of gRPCs for that. Um, frameworks uh, will be built on top of gRPCs. For example, for Ruby, there is a nice framework that's called Groof. Uh, G-R-U-F, and uh, it's a great firmware because it does everything for you in terms of generating proto uh, protofiles for Ruby from a uh, protofile, and it, simply what you need to do if you work with Rails or any MVC framework, you just need to write a controller for that, and that's it. In the controller, you specify the uh, the service that you want to build and what kind of RPC you want to build and, and it will do everything for you. So it, it's great because it, it's standardized things that you could do with gRPCs and I believe we'll see more frameworks using that uh, in future. Development tools will be used, uh, will be available to use in debug. There are already, I tried to use some of them, but it's still not easy. If you work with uh, REST APIs, you probably know tool uh, Postman or Curl. Uh, there are similar tools for gRPCs, of course, but they're not as easy to use. And that, that's just because gRPCs is great uh, to understand by humans, but it's not that great if you want to just craft your own, um, your own, uh, like craft your own request, for example. That's why there is one thing that is really nice uh, for gRPCs. If you just want to debug everything, but not uh, bother about gRPCs, uh, internal stuff like uh, creating a client and server, there is a proxy that simply you, you provide uh, you provide the HTTP request that's being sent to the proxy. Proxy is converting that to, to format uh, that's supported by uh, by gRPC server. Uh, what if you want to know more? What you want to do? Of course, go to gRPC.io website. It's not loaded with lots of information, so it's really a great start guide for everything. Uh, there is also gRPC uh, awesome list uh, with many items. Uh, when I started working with gRPC about a year ago, there was only few things. Now, it's it, there is a huge list of things that you could use. Uh, there is a gRPC command line tool, Polyglot, that I tried to use, but uh, I failed. Uh, but, but it's really... Uh, maybe for my purposes, it was not suited well, but but uh, it's recommended to to be checked. GRP curl, uh, I worked with that. It's not as easy as curl, of course, but 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 it allows you to to do gRPC server. Uh, the one thing that I love, and I when I work on development, I I just use that is gRPC HTTP proxy, because I want to think about gRPC as something that machines can communicate with, but I, as a human, I just want to quickly debug something and I'll, I'll just use HTTP proxy because it's easier for me to send JSONs than to send protobufs. Okay, that, that was quick and fast introduction to gRPC. Do you have any questions? All right, you know, or you forgot to unmute yourself. Guys, I have to remember you that uh, re remind you that you are muted. All righty. If that's all, Sergey, you, you're sure you don't have questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I just forgot to unmute myself. All right. Uh, yeah. Thank, thank you, uh, Alan. Uh, about this presentation because, yeah, I know that Alan works really hard about this GRPC and it was actually implemented uh, for as a communication tool between um, multiple services on our project. Uh, yeah, so I just have some question regarding gRPC. Like, um, uh, is there any like uh, benefit, uh, for example, uh, instead of using some like uh, kernel synchronization, for example, if we have Ruby and, for example, Elixir, right, and we can use like a C extension to communicate, uh, will the uh, uh, gRPC like uh, with the protobuf support would be faster uh, because it uses this binary stream or is there any like caveats of using that for example uh, comparing to the um, kernel communication between like like different languages okay uh, I believe it's all about serialization time because if you're using about that mostly the communication will happen uh, internally on, on one server and probably like an communication will be better. Uh, but if you're talking about internet overall, uh, it's 
it will be better just to use gRPCs than trying to do, do, do anything like uh, communicating uh, between languages because it's tenderized and uh, that's the, the huge thing. So of course, internally, you probably will find better solutions, uh, but if you just want to make sure that everything is standard, uh, I would say that it will be probably better to use gRPCs because uh, with gRPC, you have a clear contract between your services and you can build that. If you'll do other things like you title couple two different languages, you, you might end up with some trouble. So I, I will say that there's more uh, advantages of using that in the open world uh, example, not internally, or if you want to build the really loosely coupled uh, services that are communicating with each other, uh, but are not um, are not affected by change in any any of those. If there is a contract and contract is uh, is okay and it's valid, then everything will work fine and work better. I believe. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah, and also there was like uh, some uh, quick talks about using uh, quick together quick protocol like from again from Google and GRPC is from Google so together uh, for like better performance. But as I understand right now, the gRPC uh, is totally for the HTTP version two. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So um, internally, Google is using Stabi, and Stabi is using uh, SPDI, SPDI uh, protocol that's also built by Google. Um, and I know that they're using that, but it's not really well suited for the all examples. So it worked well for them, but for for the world of developers and users, it's better just to use next version of HTTP uh, that hopefully will be supported soon everywhere and we'll see huge improvements in, uh, in many areas. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about quick, uh, but I'm pretty sure that we have gRPC, you cannot change the transport layer. Uh, you can change only uh, IDLs, so you can change the, uh, the interfaces for uh, like the language for the interface you need to build with uh, certain like services with. Uh, so you could use something different. Uh, of course, recommended option will be always uh, the uh, the protobufs, but you're free to go with anything you like. You can uh, you can use, for example, uh, Cap and Proto. I believe it's it's a little bit faster even than than protobufs. Um, so you're allowed to do that, but you'll not get much help from the community because community is focused mainly on those proto buffs. All right, all right. Uh, thank you for answers. Thank you. All right, if if that's all, then thank you. Uh,